Hi, it's Wednesday, August the 9th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Mark's Gospel. And today we're in Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 16. Not a lot of verses, but yesterday was even shorter. Yesterday was just sort of 11, uh, 10 and 11 because, um, well, yesterday was uh, the moment when Judas makes a deal with the temple authorities to surrender Jesus, basically to make it possible for them to arrest him in secret. Um, and I needed to wonder a little bit about, about Judas and his role in all of this and, and what we think of Judas and what Jesus thought of Judas. And so that was wondering was yesterday. There'll be a little more probably as we go along. Um, but today we just get back into the story, get back into the narrative. And uh, well, here's the first part of it. So it's Mark 14, 12 to 16. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to Jesus, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. <coughs> Excuse me. So there we go. Um, yeah, if you've spent a lot of time reading the Bible, um, a couple things jump out right away. Um, here we're told it's on the first day of, of the unleavened bread when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. So this is at the beginning of what we would call Passover. <clears throat> um, in John's gospel, Jesus is crucified on Passover. But here in Mark, and also Matthew and Luke, um, it, it would seem that Jesus will be crucified after the beginning of Passover, right? Um, because here it is, we're having the meal. And so Jesus hasn't been arrested or, 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 or crucified yet. Um, so, with with in John's gospel, these kind of these events happen at least a day earlier. Um, so, what does that mean? Uh, does it mean that John's wrong? Does it mean that Mark got it wrong? Um, the fact that Mark and Matthew and Luke agree does that make it more likely that they've got it right and John's got it wrong? I don't know. It's 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 hard to say. Um, I, I would suggest to you that the authors of the gospel um, are are looking for um, the symbolic importance um, of, of of the crucifixion. They're trying to heighten it. So so with John to have Jesus sacrificed on the first night of Passover on the very day when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, then we can see Jesus as the lamb, lamb of God. Jesus becomes the sacrifice um, akin to, similar to the Passover lamb. And so there's a lot of symbolism in that, and that's a very definite statement about how John and John's community view Jesus and what the crucifixion means to them. And, and that's very much about substitutionary atonement and all that kind of stuff. So there it is. Um... That may not have been quite as important to to Mark, and I would suggest to you that Luke and Matthew are basically just following Mark's example. Um, so it, it, it's not as important, although we are ripe with symbols here, uh, or we will be uh, as we go through the story. Uh, and the fact is, we are here um, at the time of Passover. Jesus has come at the time of Passover. He has come to Jerusalem for this reason, because everybody's there. Um, Jesus seems to be uh, invoking this symbolism. Jesus is doing it intentionally, I would suggest. Now, I think when I sort of try to reason it out, it makes a little more sense to for this to happen a day before Passover, at least, because... Jesus is going to have to be arrested, and he's going to he's, he's going to see 
the high priest and I mean and, and, and the Sanhedrin are going to have to meet and condemn him, all of which is unlikely to happen while they're celebrating Passover. But maybe they try to rush that all in before their Passover obligation begins. They shouldn't, and we have seen from the text that they they make a show of their religious devotion, um, but in fact, deep down, they betray their commitment to God. Uh, we talked about that day before yesterday, just the idea that they want to kill Jesus. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not in keeping with God's will, killing people who bother you. Um, So, I mean, it would seem to me that that the Sanhedrin, that the, these, these temple authorities would want to take care of showing their faith. So they would maintain what needs to be maintained uh, in terms of, you know, going through the rituals and doing them properly. So that makes me kind of think, yeah, I, 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 I like the idea that... that that Mark's got this right. This is happening the day before Passover. John's just trying to heighten uh, the symbolic nature of it. And so John's just adapted it. Because, of course, John and Mark don't really care that much about chronology. Uh, I think that they're both right in that Jesus has come to Jerusalem at the time of Passover because that's part of the statement. Um, this is the big uh, religious observance for for the people of, of faith, the, the Jews, the Jewish people of faith. Um, and, and and Jerusalem is the place. It's where the temple is. So this, so Jesus has come to the right place for the most attention. Uh, Jesus is not doing this off somewhere in Galilee. Jesus is doing this right here uh, in the temple, in front of the temple, associated with the temple, all the people here. Jesus, Jesus is very intentional about this. So I don't blame the gospel writers for wanting to dig into the symbolism and, and enhance it a little bit. Because it seems to me that Jesus has done that very thing. Um, I don't know if it struck you the same way, but as I'm reading this, uh, it, it certainly feels um, well organized by Jesus. Right? It says the disciples were going, like, so where do you want us to go make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? And, and Jesus sends two. He says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go into the city, and you're going to see a man carrying a jar of water. He's going to meet you, and you'll know to follow him. You go, well, seems kind of random. Uh, at the time, I know this is strange, um, but, but the thing is, men didn't carry jars very often. That's not what they did. Um, a jar of water, well, I mean, <laughs> yes, for... For rituals that they may have preparing for the Sabbath, um, but the idea of like carrying drinking water, washing water, the, that was a woman's job. Women did that. It's not that men never did it or could never do, it, but it was it would be peculiar. It, it would be um, the equivalent of that. I think for 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 my time and place would be if Jesus said, "So go into the city, and you'll see a man with a red purse." Now, what you do is follow him. Now, lots of men. Uh, will have purses um, and lots of folk who don't identify in a binary way whatsoever may carry purses but culturally by and large if you saw a man with a purse you'd notice it for a second because it's not what you're used to seeing I would suggest it's the same thing so Jesus is basically saying okay so there's going to be a guy here you're going to see you know you'll be able to tell because he's you know he's he's, he's got a, a white Carnation in his, in his in his lapel uh, <clears throat> feels very set up, and 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 then <laughs> follow him. So you'll see him, you nod each other. You know, you'll follow him. He's going to go to a house. Then you go to the house and say, "Quote the teacher asks, where is my guest room that I may, may eat the Passover with my disciples?" And this person is going to show you a large room. All this has been planned. All this has been prepared, and it's kind of done. Hush, hush. Jesus has not been on Airbnb and found them a place. Jesus has made arrangements. Um, why? Well, wisely, Jerusalem, um, you know, uh, Jerusalem during uh, the Passover, it would be hard to get a place. It's like trying to get a 
book a hotel room, you know, um, f- for Super Bowl weekend in whatever city the Super Bowl is being held. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. All the places have been taken. So, so Jesus made this arrangement some time ago. Now, he could have maybe just made it a week ago, but he's got some very devout disciples uh, who were just willing to change whatever plans they had to make sure there was a room for Jesus. Yes, it's also possible that Jesus made these arrangements months and months and months ago. Um, whatever it is, Jesus has made arrangements. That's the thing. Um, it didn't just happen. Jesus, I don't think in this passage, at least as I read it, I don't think Jesus is um, prophesying a thing that may or may not happen. That These are random events and Jesus, with his God knowledge, sees it all. I don't think that's it at all. This, to me, speaks of um, being set up. It's all planned that way. So as I listen to it all being planned, because so, so why has Jesus made these plans? Well, because it's hard to get a place. But I think also because I think Jesus wants to make it private. Surely there are other places to share the Passover meal um, that might have been more public. I don't know. Um, but I think Jesus is looking for a place where he cannot be found uh, or found easily because... It's not time yet. There will come a time to be arrested. right? But that's not that time yet. Now, back to my thinking about Judas yesterday. Judas went and he is looking for an opportunity now to betray Jesus. He said that's the, so he made, he made the deal with, with the temple authorities uh, and he's looking for an opportunity um, to give them access. Um, it seems to me I mean, that could be a random event. Jesus didn't know that was going to happen. Judas has just made that plan. Um, but Jesus has planned everything else. So it feels to me a little bit like Judas is part of this plan. Judas is going to look for the opportunity. Well, the opportunity does present itself at this place. It's a quiet back room, upper room. Um, why not just be there waiting for Jesus when he arrives? No crowds to see. It's all inside. Might be very easy to do. Uh, But Judas doesn't give them that offer. Right? Judas is going to invite them to get Jesus at the garden. Now, did we plan the garden in advance? I mean, (laughs) this is just me wondering. But if I was looking for an opportunity to, to to, to... have Jesus vulnerable and and, and easy to arrest quietly. (coughs) I know that he's going to have a Passover meal. I know that it's going to be in the upper room. Uh, I know that that, 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 and I know what time it's going to be. Because we know what time we start our Passover. The sun goes down, we're going to get this started. Um, So, Judas doesn't pick that room. Judas instead picks the guard. Now, Going to the garden after the meal is not part of the Passover ritual. That's an unpredictable event, and yet that's the very one that Judas alerts the authorities to. That just feels very strange to me. Feels very planned. Everything else about this is so very well planned. Jesus has planned the room and the guy with the with the with the pitcher of water so you know to follow him and the password, you know. Uh, where will my master, uh, where's the guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? All of this just seems so contrived. It seems odd to me that the Judas thing isn't part of the plan. Uh, that makes sense to me, that the Judas thing is part of the plan. But we are going to have the Passover because that's important. We will delay it until after the Passover meal. Um, and that's why Judas picks the garden and not the, the upper room. Now, into that, as I'm wondering, I can hear myself saying, yeah, okay, but maybe Jesus didn't tell the disciples where they were going to have it. That's why he sent the two off to the secret space, to the secret place, um, to make it all prepared. And it's only at the last minute, he says, oh, by the way, guys, follow me. We're going over here to Bob's place. Um, So maybe Jesus kept it from them. But it still doesn't really tell me how it is that, Jesus, that Judas knows that Jesus is going to go to the garden. <laughs> right? It just, you know, when I read the whole thing in context, it just feels so much, uh, it seems 
planned. Jesus wants the symbolism of being there at the Passover. Jesus wants to make sure that they have this meal together. Um, for what Jesus is going to say at that meal, which we'll get into tomorrow, uh, but also just just to wrap up this this part of the ministry, this this journey they've all had together to have that Passover uh, and to have it um, um, uninvaded, as it were, undisturbed, uh, just to have that time with them. Um, and so that's part of the deal. That's part of what he works out with Judas, how to do this. Okay, let's have the Passover. That just feels right to me. Um, but that's just me. And again, I seems to be on a little, I don't know, uh, I seem to be on a mission to, to redeem Judas's reputation. Um, I don't know. What I do come away with the, from this, though, is recognizing that Jesus is planning this very carefully. And it seems to me, therefore, it's safe to say that Jesus wants to celebrate the Passover with the Twelve, which, by the way, does include Judas. All right? Jesus wants to have this time with these people. Jesus, who knows that he will be arrested and crucified, um, knows because he has godlike vision of, of time and space, uh, therefore knows these things, knows because it's it's all but inevitable, uh, knows because he knows the people involved. I don't know. But he knows. He knows what's going to happen. And so he wants to take some time with his people um, and just have that, that meal with them. I sometimes wonder, just and this is just solely for me, you know, when I get involved in a big project, and I like to get involved in big projects from time to time. I get involved in a big project and it's sometimes easy to lose sight of the people that I'm in it with because there's the goal. We know where the goal is. Keep your eye on the prize. We're, we're, we're aiming to get this thing done and we work toward getting it done. Uh, and sometimes once we get it done, then in the celebration of having it done, the group sort of disbands because we got the project done and we didn't actually get to spend a moment before the celebration or whatever it is that we're trying to get done, we, we don't necessarily spend some time just being together. And I, I think I've missed some opportunities there. You know, I'm thinking about this now, and you know, as as I come to uh, um, a big project, I I would like to think that as we get into the last strokes of the project, might be a good time just to have a quiet time, not a celebration time, just a time appreciating each other, of being together, of marking the moment uh, and acknowledging that this part of what we're doing is about to come to an end. Because that's also important. Beginnings are awesome. Uh, but endings are important too. And, um, and we are coming to an end here. Right? It's not going to be the same for the disciples ever again. It's not going to be the same for the Twelve ever again. Um, the nature of the ministry is not going to be the same ever again. Uh, so we have come to an end. And it's, I, I admire that Jesus is just sort of stopping everything and making sure that they have a good end before they begin the new thing. Hmm. Yeah, there's a leadership lesson in that. It's not particularly holy. Um, but it is interesting to me. Anyway, you know what? I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there because I'm still thinking about Judas. <laughs> and, and I guess I, I'm also thinking about a little bit, and maybe it's worth thinking about, does it, does it hurt the story? Does it hurt the value of the gospel if some of us were to conclude that Jesus has set this all up very carefully? These aren't just random, spontaneous events. But Jesus has, has orchestrated these events very specifically. Is that, does that change it? Does that make it a, a less powerful, a less sincere story? I mean, because of the way stories are told, the way the Gospels are read to me as a kid, you know, everything feels just sort of almost random. And then this happened, and then Judas just decided, 
the last minute to betray Jesus, and Jesus is is taken aback by by the guards showing up, and they weren't expecting it, and and and, and nobody expected the crucifixion. Um, but then you read more close, they go, well, no, but they that, that's exactly why. And, and and you know either either we have shaped our faith as an excuse, said okay, so Jesus came to be crucified, otherwise it means that Jesus doesn't know what he's doing, and God has no plan. Um, so he said, oh no, God has to have a plan. Jesus needs, okay, so this must happen. Uh, I don't want that faith, frankly. Um, I would rather have, you know, uh, a faith that, that, that recognizes, no, 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 Jesus is intentional about this. Jesus is creating symbolic moments and does want us to, to connect to, to Passover and to all these things. Um, <clears throat> so for me, the idea of planning doesn't hurt the story. It, it, it actually enhances it. But that's not true for everybody. You might wonder for yourself, what's that? How does that feel to you? By the way, I might be wrong. I mean, you could read this story and go like, no, no, Jesus didn't plan any of this. Uh, it just all sort of happened. Uh, Jesus knew a few things, but it just happened. That's a perfectly valid reading. It's not the way the gospel strikes me. Um, so you might wonder, which is better for you and why? Huh. Okay, now i got even more to think about today. But for the moment, I'm just going to offer a prayer and call it quits. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for stories from long ago. Thank you for the work of those who write the Gospels. Thank you for the love of Jesus, whose actions and words inspire these stories, these Gospels. Thank you for your word that emerges when we wonder about these stories, when we press at them and think, what if and how come and what if that too? God, we ask that our wondering today be fruitful. We ask that it bring us closer to you. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's enough for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and we'll carry on with what happens at this Passover meal because it's kind of interesting. Anyway, until I get to see you, God bless. Please know that God sees you and loves you exactly as you are and that God's love moves through you and into the world in amazing ways. You do help share God's love even as you share your own. You matter. God bless you. See you tomorrow.